we um, are very pleased to be able to have this afternoon's session to go a little bit deeper into the conversation around partnerships for international development, uh, engaging the cooperative movement in partnerships around sustainable development uh, around the world. So this session is going to go more in depth by looking at three case studies from three different countries. Um, we are going to start with Eric Manzi, who is the Secretary General of SESTRAR, which is the Confederation of Trade Unions. And he's going to be speaking about a, a case study from Rwanda with the taxi, a collaboration between organized labor and a cooperative model through the taxi cooperatives. Um, secondly, after Eric, we will hear from Marcy Suarez. Marcy is the member services manager of Cooperativa Cafe Timor, which is the largest private sector employer in East in Timor Leste, um, is, a, is a coffee cooperative. And uh, she's going to speak about CCT and their partnership with NGOs and the fair trade movement as well as with the private sector. And then we will be having a coffee break, and after that we're going to hear from Héctor Córdoba, who is the Executive Director of the Federación de Cooperativas de Ahorro y Crédito del Salvador, so the Savings and Credit Cooperative Federation of El Salvador, uh, otherwise known as Fede Casas. And Héctor will be speaking about uh, that sector's partnerships and links with local government as an example of uh, how cooperatives are working at the local level with uh, local government. So, and then uh, at the close of that session, then we were, are going to um, have a uh, presentation by Nurjahan Begum, who is the UNIS Center advisor and former managing director of Grameen Bank. She was one of the founders of Grameen, and so we're very fortunate to have her with us, and we'll look forward to hearing from her at the end. Um, after each presentation, we're actually going to open it up for all of you to ask questions or make comments uh, after each uh, of the case studies. So you will have an opportunity for audience participation, and please come down and join the party. If you're way back there, please come down and join us. Um, my name is Amy Kokenauer Betancourt. I'm the Chief, Chief Operating Officer for International Programs at the National Cooperative Business Association, uh, CLUSA International, which is the apex organization for the United States, uh, for the cooperative apex organization that also has international programs in 19 countries around the world, working in sustainable agriculture, uh, natural resources management, and cooperative development. So with that, I would like to uh, open the floor for Eric to come join us. And um, we have used a format in this session of a TED Talk, so each speaker will be taking the floor for uh, the presentation of the case study, and then I will come back and facilitate questions. Thank you. Bon après-midi. Euh, mon nom, comme on vous l'a dit, m'appelle Manzi Eric. Je suis secrétaire général de la centrale des syndicats de travailleurs du Rwanda. Je vais vous parler euh, d'un cas d'étude d'un de nos affiliés, euh, le syndicat des taxis moto euh, et leur coopérative. Et surtout le partenariat. Alors, je veux vous parler euh, d'un cas d'étude, comme on vous l'a dit. Euh, C'est un partenariat entre le syndicat et euh, le mouvement coopératif. Pourquoi un partenariat 
Pourquoi un partenariat Tout simplement parce que, comme euh, certainement vous le savez, euh, en tant que syndicat, euh, nous travaillons euh, pour euh, atteindre ce qu'on appelle les objectifs du programme du travail décent à travers ces quatre piliers qui sont la promotion de l'emploi, la protection sociale, le dialogue social et le travail et, et le, le, le droit à milieu de travail. Mais aussi, notons et surtout que le Bureau international du travail, à travers la grande discussion qui est en train de se dérouler aujourd'hui sur le futur du travail que nous voulons, qui recommande qu'il y ait un partenariat entre plusieurs acteurs pour pouvoir atteindre les objectifs de développement. Et le partenariat est un facteur très important, une composante clé pour revitaliser le partenariat global pour le développement durable, comme euh, je l'ai énoncé par le Bureau international du travail. Cela dit, nous avons chacun besoin l'un de l'autre. C'est pour cela qu'en tant que syndicat, comme certainement vous pouvez le savoir, je crois qu'on l'a vu ce matin, les syndicats nous sommes toujours et souvent dans une posture telle que nous sommes assez fiers de nos spécificités. Et d'ailleurs, comme l'a énoncé une des présentantes ce matin, elle nous l'a dit que c'était assez difficile, qu'il y avait une sorte de conflit entre le mouvement syndical et le mouvement coopératif. Cependant, je crois que nous, en tout cas au niveau de notre centrale, au niveau du Rwanda, nous avons commencé un partenariat avec d'autres organisations et d'autres institutions qui ont les mêmes valeurs et qui partagent avec nous une même vision du développement. Je crois que tout est dans les valeurs et surtout la vision que nous avons tous de la société, d'une société qui veut aller vers une justice sociale, pour une société qui veut pour plus une réduction de la pauvreté, etc. Et l'un de nos partenaires le plus important est le mouvement coopératif. Certes, il y a eu des échecs, car le début du partenariat avec le mouvement coopératif, qui a commencé en 1987 au Rwanda, avec quelques caisses des travailleurs, comme on les appelait, qui était une caisse des travailleurs que, qui était organisée au niveau des entreprises, au niveau de certains ministères, mais qui, après cinq ans, ont connu un échec, tout simplement parce que je crois qu'il y avait eu un problème de mauvais management, une mauvaise gestion, une mauvaise compréhension, et surtout une mauvaise compréhension entre ce que devait faire le syndicat des travailleurs et ce que devait faire la coopérative de, 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 de la coopérative des caisses des travailleurs. Mais en réalité, le Bureau international du travail, à travers un projet qui s'appelle Syndicop, Syndicat et coopérative, a amené son soutien pour pouvoir améliorer en fait euh, comment, en tant que syndicat, et coopératif, le mouvement coopératif, on pouvait travailler en partenariat pour pouvoir atteindre ensemble les objectifs. Comment cela s'est-il fait Il s'est fait de cette façon. Il y a eu d'abord une sorte d'évaluation de la nature du partenariat. Parce qu'il ne faut pas se lancer dans un partenariat pour se lancer dans un partenariat. Il faut se lancer dans un partenariat après avoir fait une évaluation de ce qu'on veut. On met en place des critères de sélection qui sont basés sur l'intérêt commun, qui sont basés sur des valeurs communes, 
qui sont basés sur le membership, qui sont basés sur l'expertise et des, des connaissances assez spécifiques de l'un ou de, de, des uns des autres. Un partenariat basé sur une définition tout à fait claire et un plan d'action de ce partenariat. Et ensuite, vous pouvez signer un accord de partenariat sur base des points élaborés ci-dessus. Et ce n'est qu'après avoir signé ce contrat de partenariat que vous mettez en place des réseaux de travail pour des actions communes. Ainsi, vous pouvez en ce moment-là vous compléter avec les compétences et l'expertise dont les uns et les autres ont besoin. Il y a eu plusieurs actions, mais un de nos succès fut le partenariat avec le syndicat des taxis motos et leur coopérative. Mais avant d'aller plus loin, je vous inviterai à suivre cette vidéo. From uh, 2003, we, we have started to, to work with especially the, the taxi motor drivers. But the challenge at that time, the people say it's not easy to be just organized as a union. We need to increase our revenue because many people are the, the drivers for the different owners, the, the motor, motorcycle owners. And sometimes they don't respect they have not any contract. And that time we start to organize them in unions, but also to create in parallel a cooperatives to see how every drivers have the chance to have their own bicycle, to increase their revenue, to be organized in the cooperative to allow them to accede to the social security benefit. Nesco, Nesco, mon ami, tu as dit, 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 tu Nous avons Harimo nawe batwara amapikipiki tuba tuvuga abatariha kuvuga ngo nabakora kazi nibabone social security ngira ngo na hano natwe turacyari muri informo informo sector ariko dufite gahunda cyangwa se objective yacu nuko tuva muri informo sector tujya muri informo sector tukanane tukazanaganira na Rwanda Social Security Board kugira ngo baje wabaha no bwiteganyirize cyangwa se ubwishingizi ku mirimo yabo ya buri munsi bakwa mu byukuri ibibazo by'ibyabura gukazi ariko ntabwo babikabije cyangombwa kibaje hari no mutekano mu byukuri iyo hari ikibazo kivutse ushobora guhuzwa hagati mu mpande zombi ari abashinzwe umutekano mu muhanda ari abakoperative tugahura ntabwo abantu hawo tubatunga muri cooperative baka numuwana pa uvuye mu mubiri 
umuryango usigaye bakaha inkwa za marira eh kandi bagashobora kurihana cyane cy'inyabiziga cyangiritse ku twaye umuntu ufite amagara amazima na ufite amagara amazima now the motorcycle transport is not in a formal sector they have legal status and i think now we we start to see how to, to advocate to include the motorcycle drivers as one of categories to have the, the minimum wages. That I think it's the work we must do in the next future. Comme vous l'avez vu, comme vous l'avez vu. C'est Tankinia Rwanda, c'est la langue locale de mon pays, il n'y a pas de traduction. Mais ce qu'il a voulu dire, si vous vous rappelez, le, le chauffeur de taxi moto, si on peut l'appeler comme ça, le motard, qui est le transport le plus utilisé dans mon pays, au Rwanda, mais surtout à Kigali, parce que le Rwanda, c'est un pays, comme vous le savez, c'est des pays des mille collines, c'est avec beaucoup de collines, et avec des routes qui ne sont pas toujours assez praticables. Et c'est pour cela que les motos sont euh, le transport le plus utilisé. Il dit, il était avec sa famille, il dit, « Mon rêve, c'était un jour d'acheter ma propre moto. » Et c'était un peu le point sur lequel nous avons beaucoup travaillé, c'est de permettre à ces motards d'avoir leur propre moto. Mais aussi, après, d'être eux-mêmes des employeurs, parce qu'ils pouvaient s'acheter d'autres motos, et utiliser et faire travailler d'autres personnes. Ils devenaient aussi employeurs. Mais pour cela, il fallait quoi Il fallait s'acheter ces motos. Et voilà pourquoi, en tant que syndicat des travailleurs des, des, des motards, nous avons travaillé avec les coopératives qui ont pu, pouvoir, qui ont pu euh, euh, donner euh, des fonds suffisants pour permettre à ces gens de s'acheter des motos et d'accroître leurs revenus, mais aussi pouvoir accéder euh, aux, aux bénéfices de la sécurité sociale et accéder à un bien-être plus. Alors pourquoi Pourquoi ce partenariat Parce qu'on avait des défis auxquels on devait faire face. C'était d'abord le fait que, comme il, vous l'avez entendu dans le show, il a parlé en Irlande, il a parlé de l'informatif. Et on est venu du formel du secteur informel. Aujourd'hui, on est reconnu comme euh, une profession en tant que telle. Aujourd'hui, euh, nous pouvons accéder aux bénéfices de la sécurité sociale parce qu'il s'est avéré que euh, dans un arrangement qui avait été fait au niveau de la loi, euh, la coopérative était considérée comme l'employeur et contribuait de, à la, la part de l'employeur euh, à l'agence de sécurité sociale et le travailleur qui, en fait, le motard euh, payait sa contribution en tant que travailleur. Euh, ils ont pu euh, euh, accéder à, à l'assurance maladie. Euh, comme vous le savez, ce sont des motards, ils, étaient, ils, faisaient souvent des, ils avaient souvent euh, des accidents de, 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 de circulation et, et alors ils, ils ont pu accéder aujourd'hui euh, à une assurance, euh, une assurance maladie. Mais tout simplement, globalement, comme on le dit, ils ont aujourd'hui accédé à un travail décent. Ils ont euh, aujourd'hui, euh, nous avons lutté à la pauvreté qui existait au niveau euh, de ces motards. Comment nous l'avons fait Tout simplement, comme vous le voyez, c'est à travers une collaboration entre les syndicats et le mouvement coopératif. Et cela a eu un impact assez sérieux sur la société. Et comme je le dis, il y a eu certains échecs, c'est vrai. Au début, nous avons eu plusieurs groupes cibles qui étaient... Tous les groupes cibles étaient le secteur informel, mais nous avons eu plus de succès chez les, 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 les mototaxis, mais surtout, comme vous allez le voir plus tard, avec les, les, les transporteurs vélo, parce qu'il existe aussi des transporteurs à vélo. 
Et comme vous le voyez, euh, ce sont des transporteurs, ils transportent les personnes, mais c'est aussi euh, un transport de marchandises. Vous avez le régime des bananes là-bas qui est en fait l'aliment euh, le, 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 euh, le plus populaire, populaire dans mon pays. Comment cela se fait Effectivement, un partenariat, c'est comme un mariage, ce n'est pas toujours facile. Je crois qu'il y a d'abord la sensibilisation, et puis nous passons au niveau du recrutement. On devait beaucoup former, parce que cela demande à apprendre aux gens, à apprendre aux gens ce que fait le, tra le, le, le syndicat, ce que doit faire le mouvement coopératif. Ça passait même par la gestion même de, de ces coopératives. Mais surtout, surtout, être capable et toujours être prêt à fournir l'assistance technique, mais aussi chercher un apport financier. Parce que ce n'est pas toujours évident. Mais qui va chercher cet argent Je crois qu'on leur disait, cherchez vous-même de l'argent, c'est à travers la coopérative. Aujourd'hui, on peut dire... Mais quelle est la valeur ajoutée de ce partenariat Tout simplement parce que, au niveau syndical, nous parvenons aujourd'hui à recruter plus, plus facilement. Pour vous raconter une petite histoire, ce midi, je crois qu'il est dans la salle, il me parlait de, 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 du taux de, de, de syndicalisation qui décroît de plus en plus dans son pays. Je crois que c'est un ami australien, je crois qu'il est dans la salle. Mais aussi, c'est ce qu'on remarque au niveau international. Pourquoi Parce que je crois qu'on doit adresser des stratégies pour pouvoir garder euh, notre membership au niveau syndical. Et pour garder notre membership au niveau syndical, nous devons euh, pouvoir faire face aux besoins de ces travailleurs. Et faire face aux besoins de ces travailleurs, ça veut dire en tant que syndicat, nous avons notre rôle à jouer, ce qu'on appelle « labor rights », le droit au travail, c'est-à-dire, nous avons des spécificités en tant qu'organisation euh, qui, euh, qui, qui garantit euh, le, le, le droit d'association, le droit à, se, à, se, à se, se joindre au syndicat, le droit à négociation collective, les, les, les négociations au niveau du, du salaire euh, euh, minimum, etc. Mais de l'autre côté, il y a la coopérative aussi, ce que nous appelons, qui garantit des droits économiques, parce que la, 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 la coopérative fournit des bénéfices directs dont ont besoin ces gens. Parce que quand nous allions dans les entreprises ou alors au niveau du secteur informel, aller organiser euh, des travailleurs, qu'est-ce qu'ils nous disaient Oui, vous pouvez nous recruter, mais nous on a besoin d'argent. Et pour avoir cet argent, où est-ce qu'on pouvait le trouver C'est au niveau du de, 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 de mouvement coopératif. Voilà pourquoi euh, euh, le partenariat est très important. Mais il n'y a pas que les bénéfices, il y a aussi des contraintes. Il y a deux contraintes majeures, comme je l'ai mentionné là-bas. Il y a le premier contrainte, ce qui fait qu'il y a eu, je crois que l'a mentionné un présentateur ce, ce matin, il y a eu la première contrainte, c'est un peu la confusion entre les deux structures, syndicales et coopératives. Mais aussi, surtout, par la nature de ces deux organisations. La coopérative qui fournit des moyens financiers, la coopérative qui fournit des bénéfices directs, et de l'autre côté, le syndicat qui, parfois, euh, fournit des bénéfices assez éventuels. Et ça, ça crée parfois un certain conflit entre les deux organisations. Et puis, il y a eu quand même des cas de mauvaise des mauvaises gestions des, des coopératives qui ont fait que euh, euh, la réputation des syndicats qui ont euh, permis la mise en place de ces coopératives ont pu euh, être sérieusement endommagées. Et puis il y a eu les rêves. Ils partaient du vélo pour aller vers la moto et leur rêve c'était d'avoir un minibus et plus tard une compagnie d'aviation. Ils avaient quand même un grand rêve que nous n'avons pas pu, euh, peut-être, euh, pu, on n'a pas pu y arriver parce qu'ils rêvaient beaucoup gros, ils rêvaient gros, mais quand même, je crois qu'aujourd'hui, on est très content au niveau du Rwanda 
euh, nous avons eu quelques bons résultats. La première, on a pu accroître leurs revenus. On a pu, aujourd'hui, ils ont leur propre moto, ils ont leur propre service de sécurité qui aide la police au niveau du trafic euh, routier. Mais aussi, nous avons aussi des, 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 des coopératives qui ont leur propre euh, garage de, pour réparation de motos. Ils ont mis en place des, des assurances privées. Et aujourd'hui, ils sont capables d'utiliser des, des applications mobiles. Et aujourd'hui, comme on le fait avec Uber, hein, on peut commander une taxi, un taxi moto euh, avec euh, une application mobile. Et enfin, pour vous dire combien nous sommes satisfaits de ce partenariat, c'est que nous, avons, nous allons répliquer, et nous avons répliqué ce partenariat avec le syndicat de la construction des travers de, 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 de la construction, qui ont mis en place toutes sortes de services aux, tra, aux travailleurs. En fin de compte, pourquoi ce partenariat C'est pour atteindre, nous tous, nos objectifs c'est pour accroître le bien-être des travailleurs, mais surtout avoir un grand impact sur la société en réduisant la pauvreté et en, promo en promouvant la justice sociale. Je vous remercie. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. We have time for a couple of questions for Eric. And uh, the secret is out. You can speak English. So <laughs> that, was, that, was, uh, that was clear in your video. So um, are, do we have a couple of questions for Eric about this example of how the trade unions and cooperatives are collaborating? Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Ari. It was a great presentation. Um, I really want to know about your target. In your presentation and your film and your picture, it's all men. Do you have any policy or plan to also targeting for men in your program or your activity? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we, we uh, it's not only uh, the program for men. Of course, the taxi motor driver, the men, men people are, are, are men, huh? but we have uh, some women, I think, uh, in uh, Kigali town, in the capital, we have actually uh, six or seven, uh, you know, girls uh, uh, as a, a, a taxi motor. Uh, but also, uh, we had a program, but I, it's, not, it's not succeed. The, uh, has the, the motor driver. It was the, 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 the women uh, collect, uh, some women collect the, you know, the waste, the déchets, the déchets, yeah? et qui fabriquaient des briquettes combustibles. Uh, I don't know in English exactly, but uh, we have a program targeted at the, the, the women uh, especially. But another program for women is one of the cooperatives, the, the partnership uh, 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 with cooperatives of tea plantation. The many uh, people work in the tea plantation are women. Is one also one of the program uh, we have. It's not only the, the men, but uh, women also as targeted, are targeted. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Eric? Yes, Manuel. Oh, yes, sir. It's okay. Thanks so much, Manzi, for your good presentation. I'm Yana Sima from Uganda, yes, sir. presenting the Apex Body for Cooperatives, Uganda Cooperative Alliance. Uh, two things. Within your presentation, you talked about the challenges regarding the structure. Because you have the trade union and the cooperatives. I don't know how far you are moving ahead with the, with the, the two ideologies. Because the cooperative ideology, vis-a-vis -vis the trade union ideology, differ. So I don't know how far you have gone with it, so that it doesn't distort the, 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 the whole issue. And then secondly, how do you work 
with the apex body in regarding to your partnership with the cooperatives. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, um, concerning the, the, the ideology, I think uh, it, it was the problem, it was the problem uh, when we, we start to work with the, co the cooperative movement. As I said, in 1987, uh, we have uh, some, some initiatives, but the initiative failed. Why? Because even the, the people work in cooperatives, uh, the, the people, uh, members of the cooperatives, and the cooperative, the, the, the members of the union, sometimes they have not uh, the, the same understanding. At when, uh, after 2002, we have a, a good program of uh, international labor organization uh, where we discuss together and decide what we want. We want the social justice. We want to, to, to have a program to out of poverty of the people. That's, there is the difference, yes, but we have also some common, common goals. That's why we, we avoid the, 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 the problem of uh, ideology. Uh, concerning the, the, the partnership with the Apex, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, we work with the different Apex. Huh? Uh, for example, for the Taxi Moto, they have uh, the Federation uh, of uh, Cooperatives, of Taxi Moto Cooperatives. We work together. And also the agency uh, of cooperative, the Rwanda uh, Cooperative Agency, if, is uh, one of uh, our partners because uh, even the discussion we have with the different cooperative, we work also uh, closely with the agency of cooperative in Rwanda uh, in terms of, you know, to have a common view uh, sometimes. Of course, there is some conflict sometimes, but we, we, start, we, we, we try every, uh, uh, every time to solve in the, in the good way uh, that, that conflict. Thank you very much. Manuel. And then we'll wrap this part up. Just a microphone over here. Another one. Right here in the front. I thank you for your explanation. Uh, but still it's not clear for me. Yes. Uh, the relation between the union and the corporate. Because uh, they have different roles. And uh, a question, the members of the cooperative are members of the union as well? That is one question. The second is the drivers own the own motorcycle or there are persons that own several motorcycles but they don't work the cooperative. You know, because this is, this, is, this is important. And finally, which kind of cooperative is is a transport cooperative, saving and credit, or multi-purpose cooperative? What kind of cooperative is this uh, motorcycle cooperative? <laughs> no, I think, uh, of course, uh, in, 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 in few times it's not easy to explain, you know, the, 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 the story of uh, our cooperation, uh, but uh, it, it's clear, because uh, it's clear the, the members of uh, Unions are not necessary members of the cooperatives because in the two two organizations, the two structure, it you know the people are free to join, even in in, in, in unions and, and and cooperatives. But we 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 promote, you know, to have the two organ. For example. Uh, of the, the, the union uh, construction unions. Huh? When we organize the people in uh, construction unions, we encourage them to have a cooperative. Actually, you have the cooperative of carpentry, you have the cooperative of the different, you know, in the construction, you have many, many uh, professions. And it's it's not in an obligation, but we encourage. In terms of what I'm saying before, 
they, I explain them. We protect them in terms of labor rights, but also if you need to increase your, your, your income, if you need to be tomorrow an employer, because when we, they start, they start as a drivers. They, 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 they work for other people, but the target is to, to be the owners of their motorcycle. That's sometimes it's, it's of course, I, I, I agree with you, it's a mix. But actually, actually for the cooperatives, you can't be members of the cooperative if you are not owners for the motorcycle. If you are driver, for another people, you are not a member of the cooperatives. You become a member of the cooperatives when you have your motorcycle. That's the, the, the in, in simple the, the, the way. Uh, but uh, the, the cooperation is very, very easy uh, in Rwanda because uh, we work uh, very uh, long term uh, uh, to, to see how to, to have a common understanding. Uh. Sometimes it's not easy and uh, in other country, but uh, in Rwanda, actually, it's uh, very easy. I think uh, it's one of the, the good uh, practice there, yeah. That's an excellent example of shifting from, as a, from a worker to a worker owner and controlling the, the uh, means of work, for example, but also an example of how uh, d you could define as different organizations or different models that say define common common values common objectives common purpose and then lay that out in a clear agreement for how exactly. that shift would be made with those particular workers in the union sure. um, I'm going to I'm going to have to okay I'm going to take one more question <laughs> here I'm going to take one I think okay ma'am okay. one more question and then we're going to go on to the next presentation thank you Mr. Chairman and uh, very good evening Mr. Eric. My questions are simple. How many members are there in the motor taxi cooperative? And uh, what is the average income of each member? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I'm trying because uh, in taxi motor, uh, <coughs> the cooperative where we work with uh, they are actually, uh, it's uh, around uh, 15,000 uh, motorcycles. That's the 15,000 uh, owners of the motorcycle. But the income, it's not easy to, to have, a, a, but uh, I think um, uh, per day, per day, uh, I think the, the, the amount they receive is around uh, 10,000, uh, no, 15,000 per day, it's uh, in dollars, uh, it's around, um, let me calculate fast, <laughs> because one uh, dollar is, uh, it's around 15 dollars per day. And the question is, the, that's the do they average. earn more now yes. as worker owners? It's, uh, yes, it's they earn, Do they earn more now as worker owners, for the owners, owners than they did before? Yes. Uh, serving just as a worker for someone else? Uh, not to depend on the, the area where, where they, they work, because in town, in urban area, they receive more income, but in rural area, it's, it's, uh, it's more. So, no, it's, it's, it's a good uh, thing. Uh, uh, I invite you, you all in Rwanda to, to see <laughs> that example. No, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, impressive. Uh, me too, I'm impressed uh, by <laughs> them. Yeah. Excellent, thank Eric, yeah. thank you. Please help me uh, thank Eric for an excellent Thank question. you very much. Thank you. Okay, I would like... Uh, I wanted to make one observation uh, <laughs> okay. before you wrap up. Actually, uh, I'm going back uh, to the discussion before her question. In fact, I wanted to speak at that time. You know, uh, for becoming a member of a cooperative, you don't need to, to be the owner of uh, anything. You should have an income, independent income. So, in uh, 
for example, uh, there are different laws according to the business of the cooperative. So for agri agriculture, one needs to put, uh, have the ownership of the land. But landless laborers also can become associate member because they are earning. Similarly, in your motorcycle business, a driver can become the member of the cooperative if he has independent income and he is able to buy the share capital of the cooperative, invest in cooperative and pay the membership. Then he can become the member. This is the understanding we have in our part of the world. So that is why for women, you know, women are very less in agricultural cooperative because law says that they should be the owner of the land. But in credit and consumer cooperatives and in the service sector, there are many, many women because they don't own anything but they have income from their own work. Thank you for that observation. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Marcy, I want to invite you. Marcy Suarez up from Cooperativa Cafe Timor from Timor Leste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Good evening, everyone. Um, before uh, my presentation, I want to deliver greetings from 24,000 members of Cooperativa Cafe Timor uh, from Timor Leste. I have to be honest with you because Timor have many languages and English is not our um, first language there, so sometimes you don't understand my, my English, so maybe you can ask questions after the presentation. Um, as I mentioned before, that CCT has 24,000 uh, members, and uh, um, it was uh, formed in 2000 uh, and also legalized in 2005 in April and um, as primary cooperative yes and in 2000 in 24 in 24,000 members there are 3,000 female farmer members as we mentioned before and also we discussed before um, uh, in CCT we we have uh, eight groups of farmer, um, big groups of farmer, and in 18 group is uh, only four group is leading by a female farmer, and uh, the cooperative is operated in Timor Leste in 13 municipalities, and um, we have employed 530 full uh, staff, and we also have uh, seasonal staff up to. Uh, 3,000 uh, for every harvest um, time. And that's why I, will, I really uh, proudly want to state here that uh, CCT is one of larger free trade and organic coffee producers in the world. And CCT cannot be uh, state that quote if we don't have any partnership with other um, uh, national NGOs or international NGOs or other donors that's why we have like in, in under the in here we have in in very bottom uh, of the the picture we have donor that we consider as a column of the cooperative, and uh, in reality, the city has more than five partner, international partner. So that's why we have a positive impact of this uh, partnership in improving the life of the cooperative members. Um, I just want to uh, take a case study here, the partnership between CCT and uh, Fair Trade. Where uh, Fair Trade and CCT, they together have the certification and premium 
from the certification and premium, we can, you know, the impact is to provide uh, health service and farmer training and gender and social inclusion. And let me uh, explain more about it. So, um, ACCT uh, has a organic certification uh, since 2000 by fair trade and also other certification for organic for, through the coffee practice and also use that. And through the certification, um, we, we, we prove that all the members is certified. And through the certification, we have um, like a very stable uh, coffee price through the fair trade process it's fair between the seller and the buyer. For example, for the coffee price, whenever the board coffee price is getting low, through the premium, the seller or the, the farmer can be uh, maintained with the, you know, the, the level of the fair price. For example, in, in the world with the coffee, where the coffee price is getting around one point, uh, $2 per pound, with the free trade and premium, it can be still at the $1.90 per pound. And in reality, CCT uh, annually sell 5 million uh, Arabica coffee uh, for the buyer. Yes, through the premium and the, the the benefit of the partnership in every city to provide services, uh, the social services that including uh, health services. So through health services, CCT Cooperativa Cafe Timor has seven fixed clinics, 26 mobile clinic sites, and we provide um, uh, primary health care and also. Uh, as, uh, beside the primary health care, we also have community health uh, education and promotion. We have community extension program, which is really focused on uh, maternal and child health uh, services. And also we combine with men's health program, where that program uh, have some, um, you know, um, uh, some uh, link with uh, maternal and child service. Why we choose uh, men's health program? Because in Timor Leste, I, I think in, in, in Asia generally, men is the main decision making maker in the family. So in reality, in, in East Timor, whenever a mother, even in very crisis situation, where uh, she needs to be referred to health facility, she has to she has to wait for her husband around, and her husband should be make decision before she go to 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 hospital. This is the reality. That's why the city considered to to engage men in this uh, in our services. So our achievement since uh, we start the services in two thousand, we has uh, we have uh, covered more than. 2 million consultation, and I just checked with my data entry. Till October this year, we covered 2 million point five, 2.5 million. So that's including 70, 97% immunization coverage in our service area. And also, um, that's for children under five. We have 50% of family planning coverage you know, East Timor is a Catholic um, country. We have 90% of Catholic population. But um, with the very, you know, very aggressive uh, collaboration, it's not only government, uh, you know, government duty, responsibility to do this thing. So through cooperative, we also deliver this, this, this program. And also we cover 94 percent of antenatal care for pregnant lady. Um, our targeting uh, every month 10,000 to 20,000 community we serve 
based on our target, really we have to uh, cover 110,000 or 100, till 130,000 uh, population. Um, I'm just trying to get us to have a look to watch together the services of yeah, the health service of the CCT. This is an extraordinary story that speaks to the very heart of the cooperative concept. That profit shared by the members can change the entire community. In East Timor, the largest provider of health care is a coffee grower's coal, whose organic fair trade beans are a staple of Starbucks and thousands of other shops around the world. The impact of this project is enormous in this country. We consider CCT the largest private sector employer in the country. You're empowering them to run their own lives, their own economic lives, their own family lives. Well, because it's a cooperative, uh, as they accrue profits, they vote on how these, uh, how these profits should be allocated to their social well-being. Um, Ami, Kader Mayusi, Mayus Agriculture. He is also as a farmer before. Just uh, since now, he he has a position in the board of CCT. He feels that he has obligation to pay attention, like a to look after the farmers. So it's like to help them. That's the best part of the story, because yeah. they're able to prove such high coffee sell it at such high prices. They're able to accrue significant profits, and fortunately the cooperative every year votes to use these profits for their health care and their education programs. Uh, they're able to now provide health care for over 20,000 families in the area. Yeah, thank you for watching. And um, we also have another program through the partnership with the fair trade. We call it. Uh, we call that about uh, farmer training. So in farmer training, based on the internal uh, family survey, internal agriculture survey, in 2016, we cover 90 percent of our members. We have trained them. So we combine the training between individual training and corporate, the group training. Why we have that strategy? Because if we only do the individual training, it's going to be hard for the staff because we have 24,000 members. You know, it's spread around the country. And that's why we have uh, the group training. So it's make it easy and more, uh, more, um, uh, opportunity to monitor and evaluate them. Uh, the training is more focused on the stamp and pruning, farm maintenance, and also organic farming techniques. And we have three dedicated staff to doing this program. We can see here, yes, we have uh, photos. So this is the activities for the training. We also involve women inside the program as a commitment from the cooperative. Another element is gender and social inclusion program. Since 2000 till November 2015, I have to acknowledge that CCT is not really seriously taking to our consideration to look after or consider that women is taking an uh, important role in the uh, coffee production. So, um, CCT has a, a thought based on the assembly and also the discussion with the member. They want to us to address the gender program in our, our uh, cooperative. So, at the first time, at the, you know, before 20, before November 2015, the, the female farmer we consider 
that's based on the registration, uh, registration only 7%. And uh, after November 2015, and that's when we're doing the gender analysis, we, we, we registered that there are 25, 29% women involvement in coffee production. Um, that's when we try to manage the process of identification. Previously, we just registered about the chief of, house, of household uh, in, in, the, in the cooperative, in the group, and also the owner of the land or the owner of the farm. But with the gender analysis, we change. We still maintain, we keep the identification, the registration about the chief of, of household and also the farmer, on, the owner of the land, but also we registered who are the active farmer. That's why after 2015, November 2015, we can find that the involvement and the acknowledgement of the woman uh, uh, participation in coffee production is getting higher. We can see here it's going up till 46%. So in society also based on gender analysis, we create and also we, we have a gender and social inclusion policy. We signed it in uh, 2006. And based on gender and social inclusion uh, policy, we have a target that in, in 2020, we have to cover yep, uh, now in, at, the, at this level, we only have 15% of female, eh? the involvement of female, female uh, farmer active in all business activity, including training, only 50%. We want to achieve uh, 50%. And also at the moment, in our board in CCT, we don't have any women, but based on gender and social inclusion policy, we want to put at least the same level, the same number between men and women in our board. And um, we also want to make up to 40% women in management team. In reality, CCT only have one, and that's me in management team. Yeah, and, and I've, been, I've been very hard to get influence, to try to you know, to advocate, but it's very hard. And um, we have, at the moment, we have only 15% of female staff in our cooperative. And we want to have 35% female staff in 2020. 2020. And um, we also uh, actively engage and also provide possible assistance to member to our members who have disability situation. Um, yeah. uh, lesson learned. What we have learned since we operating, since we start uh, in 2000 and partnering with Fair Trade. Um, the question is here. How can cooperatives identify the right partner? So I think we all knew that uh, to have a partner, we have to, you know, we have to know about, you know, other other parties. So they have to be well known, capable, accountable, and trusted organization. And who doesn't know about fair trade in the world? So that's why CCT chose uh, fair trade because, you know, we all knew about them. And. It should be has the same. They have. We have to say have same objective. Yeah. Um, and uh, we knew that fair trade and CCT in this situation, we are stand for the member to have fair treatment on coffee business for the, you know, benefit of the coffee farmer. That's why we choose the fair trade. And we have to have mutualism benefit. Um, and then what is the necessary for a partnership to be successful? I think 
Uh, this question also mentioned for the first session this morning. So I just want to complement it. Uh, it should be clear task and responsibility. It should be has mutualism cooperation, transparency, honesty, and trust each other. If one part they have some you know weaknesses, we don't need to hide. We need to share, and then at that time we can you know discuss and then try to find a solution together. And it should be how I have the monitoring and evaluation, including audit inspection. So this activity can, you know, don't make us to running or walk out of the track. So here is the challenges and the opportunities. Yeah, actually we don't really have a big challenges when we have a partnership with fair trade. But sometimes we have problem with the you know, communication at the field level because we are operating in very rural area where sometimes the mobile coverage is, is not available there. So our staff need to be, you know, go by work to visit the family. So this is the situation. And, um, Maintaining a good database is also another problem because in East Timor, because they, they live far away, sometimes if the member die, so they change the owner. Uh, and also if you know, a son getting married, he has to have his own land. So that's why sometimes database is really easy to change. So, to keep to maintaining a good database is also sometimes a, big, a, a problem for us. Low level of education and traditional belief is really a big challenge for us because this is linked with people behavior change. For example, we, are, we have a training to prune and also uh, including to maintain the you know, appropriate density for the coffee uh, farm. But it's very hard because they believe that coffee is, you know, their nature. We don't need to, you know, have a human intervention. So just leave them. So it takes time. So this is the situation that we have. And also, that's really a challenge. And the opportunity, is, I think it's clear that the opportunity is about the premium and the benefit itself, as I mentioned along on my presentation previously. Um, finally, allow, allow me to emphasize that as cooperative, we cannot survive alone. Through a partnership with other organizations, whether government or non-government organization, enabling cooperative to provide various programs and benefit to our members in order to achieve a sustainable and better life based on human rights for all the cooperative members. Together we are strong and more beneficially. Have a lovely day and God bless all of us. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, just a, a short note, that film uh, was done as part of the 100-year anniversary of Anzibia Clusa, and it was the, per, the man on the film is a famous actor in the United States, and it got national coverage through our, our public broadcasting service television stations all over the country. So we were able to highlight CCT as one of the success stories of our organization over the last hundred years. And you can actually see the full film um, at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. The full film will be showing if anyone's interesting, interested in that. Any questions for Marcy about CCT? Yes, right here in the front. I'm Patricia, I'm representing NCPD, Civil Society Partnership for Development. But I work for Netrite, Network of Men's Rights in Ghana. And uh, so I'm interested in the role men play 
in, in your presentation, you did say that you are 24,000 members with 3,000 as women, meaning one eighth of your membership uh, are women. And then I ended up to an earlier intervention. We talked about women's land access and said that we, when you look at uh, farmer cooperatives or agricultural cooperatives, you don't see a lot of women in there because they don't own land. So my question is, as cooperatives, we know women play key role in the agricultural sector. And you also did mention that they are very active in the uh, coffee industry. So what are you doing to address some of the land, women's land issues to enable them own land to be able to be part of the cooperatives? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to confirm again about your question. My question is, women have land issues, yeah. as land accessibility issues. Yeah. So as cooperatives, are you working towards uh, enabling women's access to land, addressing some of the issues that hinder women from owning land so that they can also be members of the cooperative? Okay, thank you for the question. Okay. Um, I might mention before that uh, previously, based on our uh, reality, we only have 3,000 members. They are cons we consider them as the owner, as the owner. It's very hard in East Timor. Now, if I can, if I can mention that our government is trying to have, trying to, uh, you know, to create a law. To in gender sensitive in, in, in regarding to the ownership of the land, but it's still a long way to go. That's why our strategy, based on our gender analysis, so we change the registration title not to be as uh, chief of household or the owner, but uh, as the active uh, members. So that's why. At the, my some slides here, we can see after 2015, the number of the women involvement in coffee uh, production is getting higher, even to 46 percent. Is that make clear? Thank you. Other questions? Yes, in the back. government is very democratic. Um, we are democratic nations. So government has their policy to engage private sector in developing, in develop our country. So for example, in health service, my, our division, health, uh, health, health division of CCT, we have uh, cooperation MOU with government. So they also supporting us to deliver a good and uh, you know, a sustainable service, health services to our members. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. I do think it, it's worth pointing out, Marcy, that the gender policy development was really part of a donor partnership with yeah. the, uh, the government of New Zealand, uh, who really pushed the idea of CCT taking on the gender, gender work and I think that has, I think it's been a really positive outcome for the, for the cooperative to, to take a proactive look and at their policies, the way they register land, the way they incorporate women and, um, and that's another example of how the, a partnership, partnership was able to yes. positively influence the, 
the uh, results of yeah. the cooperative in terms of gender inclusion. Yeah. Any other questions? So, um, at this time, we are, we have been, I've been told, we've been discussed uh, not actually taking a coffee break, and the reason for that is because we were, we started late, and we want to make sure that we would give each of our speakers the right amount of time and, and leave enough time for our, our final speaker as well. Um, if you need a bio break, please feel free to do that on your own. But um, we would like to see if there's any other questions right now for Marcy. There's one in the back, yes. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Claudia from uh, AO Good and Learning Organization of the United Nations. I'm very much impressed with your presentation. And one question or two questions. The one is related to the, the health service uh, that your organization provided. Is it a partnership with the private health service provider or your organization is actually providing the health service? That's one I, I couldn't really get it from your presentation. And the second question is, is it the providing such health service is, is a big incentive for the partners to join the group or you know the cooperative itself, the producers cooperative itself is, is an incentive for the, the members to join together. Because what we see is, is a lack of social safety net in the rural area, particularly with those public organizations, is, is a common issue in, uh, in, in many countries. So I'm very curious to know what your experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arna. That's really very good question. Um, CCT uh, is a uh, one big private sector, and also the one of the primary health care provider, the private primary health care provider, provider in Timor Leste. So we do, we provide the services. We not uh, cooperate with other NGO or organization to deliver the services. As I mentioned before, uh, we have uh, an MOU with the government to be, you know, hand in hand to provide the service for the community and. In reality, CCT, when we provide the services, it's not only for our members, but also it's open and free for all the members around the coverage area. That's for the first question. And the second question, um, I just got lost it, the second one, I'm sorry. Yeah, the second question is, is the strong incentive or not? Okay. Um, the health service, it was the start in 2000. It was based on the assembly decision. When, after independence, you know, the, you know, the nation with the war after, after you know, the, the referendum, we have a lot of and massive uh, destroy in all the health facilities. So that's the time the members, they, they sit together in the assembly and they decide that uh, Health service is needed for all, this, all the members because government couldn't provide it at the time. So it's 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 it can be incentive, but also that's the needs of the cooperative. Yeah. One one of the reasons why the producers of that documentary that I meant that you saw a clip of chose this project to highlight uh, as an example of a, a successful cooperative is because CCT, with the premiums on fair trade, uh, the premiums on the coffee, chose to invest their social investment in the health system because of the lack of access in those rural areas for coffee growers. So the sh demonstrating both the economic and the social benefit of the cooperative was something that these uh, documentary producers wanted to do and one of the reasons why they selected this project to highlight. So it is a really great example of that. And it's an example of how uh, cooperatives both serve a, a civil society role as well as, as, as a private sector role in our partnerships. So with that, please help me think, to thank Marcy for her excellent presentation. Thank you so much. So, I'm going to introduce Hector Cordova to come up to the stage from Fede Casas in El Salvador.
Bueno, eh, buenas tardes. En primer lugar, quiero agradecer a Cooperativa de las Américas y a la Unión Europea que nos han facilitado estar acá precisamente presentes. Eh, como FEDECASE, que somos una federación de cooperativas de ahorro y crédito, eh, para poder eh, mostrar lo que es una estrategia de expansión eh, que estamos impulsando desde hoy para el periodo precisamente de la crisis que se destapó en el año 2007. ¿Comenzamos con el video? Ya. Eh, bueno, eh, particularmente decirles, eh, la estrategia es una estrategia de expansión de transitar de cooperativas eh, al territorio como actores locales. Eh, comento, El Salvador es un país de la región Centroamérica con 21.000 kilómetros cuadrados, tenemos 6.5 de población, eh, millón, 6.5 millones de población y el país está eh, bueno, acompañado de Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua alrededor y se ha organizado con 14 departamentos y 262 municipalidades. El Salvador ha sido siempre caracterizado por una población pujante, laboriosa, pero no ha escapado a problemas de inequidad y pobreza, que hasta antes de los años 80 incluso estuvo acosado por regímenes militares que destaparon en, destacaron un conflicto bélico de 12 años que cerró en el 92 con los acuerdos de paz que se firmaron, eh, pero como todo conflicto, en este caso reportó más de 75 mil fallecidos, miles de desaparecidos y toda una población afectada. Este conflicto y la presión política, así como la ausencia de oportunidades económicas, ha causado un fenómeno migratorio de décadas que ha implicado que además de las 6 millones de personas, hay 3 millones afuera viviendo, eh, particularmente en el lado de los Estados Unidos. Y esto significa, ustedes saben, riesgo de derechos humanos, eh, desintegración familiar, pero también refleja, además de problemas a la familia, una incidencia sobre la economía salvadoreña. Estamos hablando de las remesas familiares, un influjo de recursos muy importante de alrededor de 4.500 millones de dólares que ingresan al país anualmente, que significa el presupuesto del país a nivel nacional, eh, perdón, y tiene el 17% del, del, del Producto Interno Bruto como magnitud. No obstante, se terminó el conflicto, definitivamente los problemas han sido recurrentes de pobreza y exclusión y ahora también se enfrenta a un problema de delincuencia y crimen organizado, como pasa en varios de los países de la región, y esto ha tenido un efecto directo sobre el territorio. Particularmente, eh, uno podría imaginar eh, lugares, pueblos muy bonitos, eh, muy bien estructurados, pero están siendo despoblados, porque la gente no puede normalmente residir o no hay actividad económica en el territorio por los riesgos que hablamos. En este sentido, FEDECASE y sus cooperativas hemos asumido el compromiso de impulsar una estrategia de inclusión financiera que tiende a incidir en el territorio eh, para lo que es la reactivación. Esto ha pasado por una reestructura de la imagen de las cooperativas, la hemos estandarizado a efecto de que se vea un sistema y no cooperativas dispersas y se puede ver en la gráfica a partir de los años de la crisis de 2007 tanto el activo como la movilización de ahorros y el patrimonio han sido realmente con crecimientos exponenciales en todo el territorio para todas las cooperativas de ahorro y crédito. Y esto solo ha sido posible por la dimensión de la expansión en el territorio que hemos transitado de 55 agencias que había en el 2007 a 115 agencias en el 2017. Eso significa que se ha ido a más municipios y con una red de cooperativas de más de 100 sucursales. Podemos ver el caso de la inclusión financiera con los receptores de remesas familiares que alrededor de 40 mil que mensualmente llegan a cobrar una remesa ya se reportan 31 mil 31 personas que dijeron nos hacemos miembros en cada una de estas agencias, lo cual es inclusión financiera y significa la constitución de la red de cooperativas FEDECASES que nosotros damos en llamar. Eh, quiero comentar por el tema el impacto territorial que tienen estas agencias junto con la alianza en, en, con actores locales y cito dos casos de dos cooperativas, la Casipaquia 60, de una relación con la iglesia y una relación con el gobierno municipal también como caso. Vamos a ver el caso de la cooperativa que se ha vinculado con la iglesia, el caso de Acasipaquia. La primera impresión que, que tuve de la cooperativa es el papel de desarrollo que ellas tienen, que no es 
convencional o no es tradicional de, de la banca comercial. Actores importantes en el desarrollo de las economías locales de cada uno de los pueblos o, o municipios donde ellas se encuentran. Y hablo de alianzas, pero hablando de alianzas que son naturales, esta cooperativa tiene más de 50 años y su origen está vinculado a la iglesia, o sea que la alianza no es un aspecto coyuntural, sino ha sido natural. Bueno, es de recordar también que eh, en el caso de nuestra cooperativa nace en el seno de la parroquia. Uno de los fundadores fue el párroco eh, de ese entonces, cuando la cooperativa nace. Eh, ha sido una relación muy estrecha cooperativa-parroquia en cuanto a la ayuda a los necesitados, en la responsabilidad social para con la comunidad y, y estamos en, en continuo e implementación pues, de ayuda a, la, a los necesitados, a los que... En este sentido, también decimos que las alianzas han transitado a la integración. Este párroco ya es miembro de la cooperativa. Desde la experiencia que hemos tenido junto con la cooperativa, eh, nos involucramos pues, de lleno. Vimos que era una experiencia que se podía manejar desde una responsabilidad social, desde un compromiso con la comunidad y como se nos ha enseñado desde la iglesia, eh, la globalización de la solidaridad que se viene a manifestar en la responsabilidad social que las cooperativas este, tienen. Soy el padre Francisco Gutiérrez, párroco de la parroquia Nuestra Señora del Rosario, Nueva Concepción, Chalatenango. Actualmente presidente del Consejo de Administración de la cooperativa ACASIPAC de RL. También vamos a ver el caso del impacto territorial en un municipio, San José Guayabal, con la expansión dirigida que es parte de la estrategia anticrisis que nosotros nos planteamos. El caso es a 60 con una articulación con el gobierno municipal. Eh, San José Guayabal es un municipio situado en la zona norte del departamento de Cuscatlán. Es un municipio de 44.81 kilómetros cuadrados, una población que oscila casi alrededor de 11.000 habitantes, eh, dividido en nueve cantones, cinco barrios y una colonia. Eh, características de la población es altamente eh, la riqueza del municipio es eh, la agricultura, me da una agricultura de siembra de cereales básicos, poco de caña, café. ¿Cómo estaba Guayabal antes de venir a 60 al municipio? Era un municipio, obviamente, con mucha gente que tenía su negocio y guardaba el pisto en, en, en llámese, bajo, bajo el colchón de la cama, en closet. Yo tuve la experiencia personal. Bueno, ahí tienen el, los subtítulos también para que lean ya. Venir a 60 al municipio, era un municipio obviamente con mucha gente que tenía su negocio. Bueno, como el alcalde también testimonia de... En, en, bueno, en, ya me sé, bajo el colchón de la cama, en closet. Yo tuve la experiencia personal de trasladar en aquel tiempo cerca de 40.000 colones y muchos de esos billetes iban comidos por las ratas. Y por otro lado, había un común denominador. La gente era presa fácil de la gente que le, para poder abrir un negocio, tener una, una empresa, eh, tenía que tocar las puertas de ciertos prestamistas aquí, que era su puerta para que le dieran financiamiento, 
tanto para labores eh, o inversiones agrícolas y, o inversiones en otro tipo de comercio. Cuando vino a 60 abrió la venta, las puertas a los servicios financieros de calidad, la gente ya no tenía eh, el riesgo, pongamos un porcentaje poco de la población, podía trasladar sus, sus eh, su efectivo o sus movimientos a, a cierta banca de, de San Martín. También decirles que mucha gente fue presa de robos en el camino, ¿no? de robos de dinero, tanto a la hora de sacar dinero de aquí como de regresar con dinero de los bancos de San Martín. ¿verdad? Entonces, a 60 vino a ser eh, la solución, ¿verdad? fomentó el cooperativismo, eh, el cooperativismo a nivel de, de, de la gente y empezó a, a romper la brecha de la, del temor a, a, del acercamiento más bien a la, a la, al sistema financiero formal ¿verdad? y eh, esto ha impulsado el desarrollo del municipio ¿verdad? hemos visto con mucho agrado en la cantidad de personas que obtienen préstamos que tienen sus depósitos en A60 y ha contribuido a la, a la formación de nuevas empresas dentro de Guayabal ¿verdad? ha dinamizado la economía local, ha generado empleo local aquí mismo y los servicios financieros que nos prestan son de calidad e incluso estamos trabajando con la man, de la mano en ciertos servicios como alcaldía que nos presta 60. A 60 previamente llegó porque estábamos pagando un subsidio del gobierno por el tipo de población vulnerable del, del territorio. Mi nombre es Ana Miriam Montes de Rivas, actualmente gerente general de A60 DRL. A60 con el crecimiento que ha tenido, pues también se expandió para el departamento de Cucatlán en, en el municipio de San José Guayabal. La idea inicial de aperturar una agencia en San José Guayabal, este, pues previno de la, de la necesidad en su momento que la municipalidad de, esa, de ese municipio hizo las coordinaciones y también nosotros buscando ampliar nuestros servicios en, en los diferentes puntos de, de nuestro país, este, en coordinación con FEDECAS, nace la idea con el señor alcalde, el, el señor Vila, Vilanova actualmente, cuando el gobierno inició dando el subsidio, pagándolo en efectivo a, nuestro, a nuestra población, el subsidio del gas copano, a raíz de eso, pues el señor alcalde hizo las coordinaciones con, con nuestra agencia central para que este, nosotros fuéramos a pagar el subsidio del gas propano a, a través de, de nuestra agencia altavista en ese momento, ahí en la, en la alcaldía municipal de este municipio. Ahí dieron un espacio para que se abriera como una ventanilla e ir a pagar el subsidio, ya que a través de FEDECASE pues, se logró ese convenio de que a través de, de nuestras cooperativas se hiciera el pago de subsidio a todas las personas que tenían derecho en, en ese momento. Y todo lo que A60 presenta, todo es inclusión financiera. Ahí no había otra institución, entonces todas las cifras son inclusión financiera. A esta altura, 1.571 personas se han afiliado a la cooperativa, han invertido 205 mil dólares. Esa población significa el 26% de la población económicamente activa, el 14% de la población total y el 30% de hogares. Además de la inversión en capital, esa gente ha ahorrado 912 mil dólares, que sumado a los 200 mil hay como 1.100.000 mil dólares que han servido para dar créditos de alrededor de 1.671.000 dólares, que se complementa con fondos que la Federación le presta a la cooperativa. Eh, agregar que también se han atendido 3.746 operaciones de remesas familiares por un monto de 1.277.000 dólares y colectado o re, o, bueno, recibos de servicios básicos, 8.323 operaciones con 162.000 dólares. Toda esta economía, como la dijo el alcalde, con mucho celo y la gerente, se hacían en otro municipio. O sea, la población de San José Guayabal trabajaba para el desarrollo de otra municipalidad. Y con este esfuerzo de la agencia en el propio territorio, la economía recicla los recursos de la propia población y eso lo hace 
sostenible en el tiempo porque no depende realmente de recursos externos el esfuerzo cooperativo eh, en el municipio de San José Guayabal. Y esa es la historia de todas las agencias que se instalan en las cooperativas de acuerdo al programa de expansión dirigida que tenemos. Y eh, definitivamente la cooperativa ha llegado para quedarse porque es propia de la población. Y esto a través del acceso a servicios de ahorro, seguros, préstamos como remesas familiares y otros. Oigamos unos testimonios. Mi nombre es Cledia Alicia Cáceres Calderón, tengo 28 años de edad, tengo dos hijos, eh, tenemos un, un negocio de piñatería, ya tenemos de 8 o 9 años de tenerlo, gracias a Dios. Eh, mi nombre es Santos Amadeo Monterrosa, me dedico a la crianza de cerdos, un proyecto que inicié con la ayuda de, del banquito que tenemos acá en Guayabal. Eh, Elaboramos la piñata desde el comienzo hasta terminarla completa. Tenemos más accesorios para venderla para una fiesta. Fíjese que antes de tener acá la cooperativa, nosotros teníamos que buscar a alguna otra persona porque a veces nos quedábamos sin capital semilla para poder ir a comprar y no teníamos un lugar donde poder ir a hacer un crédito acá para poder hacer las compras por mayor, porque hay temporada que necesitamos tener bastante material y no teníamos cómo hacer para comprarlo. Pues tal vez este era un poco confusa por la cosa de pagar recibos, teníamos que viajar a otro pueblo, a cancelar, digamos, a San Martín, que es un más cercano. Y ahora pues pagar recibos para acá, muy fácil para nosotros, visitándolo. Pues fíjese que más que todo con el acceso a crédito, porque ellos nos han ayudado bastante y hemos podido engrandecer, porque antes nada más teníamos lo que era piñata, ahora ya tenemos estante, tenemos también esta otra parte que nos ha ayudado, que ha sido gracias al, a los créditos que ellos nos han proporcionado. He trabajado por tres años con el banco, he sacado unos cinco créditos, y es por eso que he fomentado la crianza de los cerdos. He logrado vender un aproximado de unos 80 cerdos, eh, con los préstamos que he adquirido del banco. Fíjese que acá teníamos que ir hasta San Martín, pero acuérdese que implica que uno va allá con el riesgo de que cuando uno venga ya no tener, que le pase algo en el camino. Entonces ya con esto nos beneficia porque lo tenemos cerca. Bueno, igual cada uno de estos casos de agencias definitivamente son actores locales en el territorio. Se integran a la comunidad y ese es el esfuerzo que hace la red de cooperativas en el sentido de hacer gestión para la reactivación del territorio. La idea de que haya municipios dormitorios es lo que hay que combatir a nuestro juicio. Y este es el esfuerzo que se ha hecho, que parte de poner en el centro a la persona, ya que en el caso de 2007 las cooperativas tenían alrededor de 70 mil miembros y hoy en 2017 están reportando 245 mil. La gente ha tomado la decisión de incorporarse a las cooperativas como asociados, lo cual para nosotros es un elemento importante. Y en términos de género, el 48% de los miembros del Consejo de Administración son mujeres, el 49% de empleados son mujeres, el 43% de los gerentes de cooperativas son mujeres y el 28% son presidentes del Consejo de Administración en base a la política de equidad de género que promovemos. En conclusión, quiero compartir dos aspectos uno, a nuestro juicio, ¿qué son los elementos que permiten que se trascienda de ser simplemente una cooperativa proveedora de servicios a ser un actor de incidencia en el territorio? Uno es la afiliación masiva de la población, cosa que no hace cualquier proveedor, que significa democratizar el sistema financiero porque se lo damos en propiedad a la gente. En segundo lugar, que tiene la posibilidad de hacer sinergia con la acumulación reputacional y de liderazgo en el territorio, haciendo las alianzas con los actores locales. Y en tercer lugar, que no es un esfuerzo nuevo que tiene que esperar 3, 5 años para comenzar a arrancar. Es una cooperativa de 50 años que puede una agencia, que va con tecnología informática, que va con recursos, que va con expertise, inaugura y al día siguiente o los dos días después se está dando servicios. Y el otro elemento tiene que ver con los aspectos del impacto en el territorio por parte de las cooperativas. Y aquí hay cinco aspectos a mencionar. Uno, la reactivación económica, porque ya los recursos no van afuera, sino que quedan adentro y se reciclan para generar oferta y demanda. Lo otro es que mitigue el riesgo de seguridad, que mencionamos que es un problema, porque la población no tiene que ir a otro municipio a hacer sus transacciones y la institucionalización 
comunitaria de la cooperativa, porque la cooperativa se convierte en una entidad, en agencia, una entidad propia de la comunidad. Y lo otro es la integración con actores locales que trasciende la parte de la política de alianzas. Y el último punto que yo anuncio aquí es la sostenibilidad, porque la cooperativa, como le mostré en las cifras, casi con recursos propios de ahorros y capital, prácticamente genera su volumen de operaciones al servicio de la gente, en complemento con lo que la federación pone de créditos, y eso es cooperación entre cooperativas, porque los excesos de otras cooperativas van en complemento a las cooperativas locales para poder cumplir todos todo los requerimientos de servicios que la población tiene en el territorio, en alianza, pues en este caso, con lo ha sido con la iglesia o con los alcaldes municipales, quienes nos han pedido inclusive que pongamos una agencia, en tanto que sus gobernados tienen que ir a otros municipios a hacer sus transacciones. O sea, ha sido a requerimiento y entramos por la puerta principal, como nosotros lo decimos, y no llegamos simplemente como vendedores de servicios, sino como aliados eh, estratégicos en el territorio. De igual manera quiero compartir que a nuestro juicio esto tiene vinculación con los ODS, uno en el alivio de la pobreza, cero hambre a través de la generación de empleo decente y crecimiento económico, también la parte de equidad de género y la tan ansiada paz. Nosotros que venimos de una guerra sabemos lo que vale la paz, que puede generar espacios de democracia y de estabilidad a toda la población. Eh, quiero eh, decir que esto es un esfuerzo, eh, que lo diseñamos como estrategia anticrisis en el 2007 y dijimos no nos vamos a retirar de la gente, vamos a ir hacia la gente. Ya, voy a hacer unos comentarios al final, después del video, no sin antes reiterar el agradecimiento a Cooperativa de las Américas y a la Unión Europea por apoyar la posibilidad de que vengamos a presentar qué es lo que a nuestro juicio se está haciendo como la estrategia de expansión hacia el territorio. Quiero comentar lo siguiente en nuestra perspectiva sobre los ODS. Eh, uno es que los ODS son incluyentes, no pretendemos trabajar sobre los 17 para maternidad trabajando en ninguno. Ya dije los que se vinculan de alguna manera con el quehacer natural nuestro. En segundo lugar, se requiere de actitud. Nosotros estamos promoviendo la idea de que la gente los identifique. También que es importante trascender de ser ejecutores de proyectos a promover procesos de transformación en el territorio. A Marcia Sen, un premio Nobel de Economía, decía que no era o no se trataba solo de incrementar la oferta de servicios, sino de dotar de capacidades a la gente para promover transformaciones, que es diferente, es mucho más cualitativo. Proveedores de servicios hay hasta los agiotistas que daban préstamos en, en, en San José Guayabal. Por otro lado, las alianzas que no deben de ser de enfoque coyuntural y que deben de irse hacia la integración en el territorio. La cooperativa debe de ser como la parroquia, la cooperativa debe de ser como el punto de policía, la cooperativa debe de ser como la escuela del, del pueblo y no como un actor externo. Por otro lado, eh, eso permitiría que se deje ver a la cooperativa como un donante y por otro lado, al final quiero decir que para el cooperante sería importante que estos esfuerzos de expansión se apoye no tanto en dar recursos, sino en facilitar el pronto alcance de los puntos de equilibrio para bajar el estrés, digamos, de los gerentes y los directivos de las cooperativas que solidariamente extienden su brazo de apoyo a un territorio nuevo de, y hacer nueva membresía. Eh, no quiero cerrar sin decir de que esto tampoco lo hemos hecho solos, y yo quiero... Bueno, de indicar, somos miembros de la Cooperativa de las Américas, estamos vinculados al WOCO de alguna manera también, y la DGRB de Alemania nos colabora con asistencia técnica, no dando dinero, sino asistencia técnica para que podamos hacer lo que logramos hacer hasta ahora. Bueno, muchas gracias. Héctor, muchas gracias por esa excelente presentación. Y un ejemplo muy uh, lindo, muy interesante de cómo se hacen uh, alianzas a nivel local, tanto como a nivel nacional. Um, any questions for Héctor? One of the, no, <laughs> no, not so, not so fast, not so fast. Um, one of the questions, Hector, that I had uh, was 
relating to the uh, relationship between uh, these local partnerships and your ability to expand nationally. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Bueno, quizás este es un asunto de, de anécdotas. ¿ve? Hemos encontrado diversidad de, 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 de esquemas. Por ejemplo, hay un, hay un pueblo que se llama San Julián, que el alcalde veía pasar a la población de diferentes municipios por el territorio y iban a hacer operaciones en una cabecera departamental. Y ellos decían, bueno, nosotros podemos convertirnos precisamente, más que en el corredor, ser un pivote. Y nos pidió que una cooperativa cercana instalara una agencia ahí eh, a petición de ellos. Evidentemente, en la inauguración de las agencias, el alcalde está presente. En este ejemplo de San José Guayabal, que narramos en el video, el alcalde dijo, si van a afiliar población, yo quiero ser el primero que me inscribe en esta agencia y se afilió. Bueno, el párroco, más bien quiero decir, en el caso de Casipac, son dos curas los que son del Consejo de Administración. Y uno es presidente del Consejo de Administración y están potenciando el trabajo de la cooperativa. Y así hay diferentes expresiones eh, que hemos logrado encontrar con los gobiernos municipales y además mantenemos una distancia y la ponemos demasiado transparente con ellos. Por ejemplo, a veces nos han querido dar alojamiento para que la agencia se ponga adentro del edificio de la alcaldía municipal, pero como sabemos, los alcaldes representan fracciones partidarias, nosotros preferimos estar afuera, aunque contamos con la con el apoyo y la alianza con los alcaldes, pero no nos vinculamos más de lo que podría confundir a la población en general. Excelente. Yes, question back here. Yes. Quiero aclarar, yo soy economista también, ¿verdad? Y este, esa es parte de las inquietudes que se dice. Mire, esta gente estaba pagando a los agiotistas y pagaba el 10, 15, 20% mensual de interés. Y la gente valora realmente el acceso a servicios y cuando la tasa de interés realmente es una tasa de mercado, la gente sabe la diferencia. Normalmente, y ustedes vieron el caso de un productor de cerdos, una persona muy humilde, que inició el trabajo con la cooperativa. El caso de la joven, la mujer que expresó su negocio, ya tiene como 3, 4 años antes de que se le dio más capital de trabajo. Pero la gente valora y obviamente lo que hacemos es que la cooperativa, como es una experiencia que viene de la central, sabe, digamos, hacer toda la gestión de, de riesgo crediticio, medirlo, para poder calificar los créditos porque no tenemos capacidad de donar fondos porque son propios de la gente, no tenemos donaciones para regalar dinero, entonces se hace clasificación de riesgo y la tasa de morosidad siempre anda abajo del 5%. La disciplina nuestra es que no sea mayor al 5% incluyendo los vencimientos y la cartera total y la cooperativa se obliga a hacer las provisiones periódicas de respaldo eh, para poder eh, sanear en el caso que sea necesario un crédito, pero nosotros no generamos la cultura de no pago, más bien la gente lo que tratamos de hacer es que tenga la cultura del acceso permanente a los servicios. Any other questions? Hector, one question I had was um, en cuanto a las remesas. Uh, que mucha gente ha ido de los pueblos, se han ido a los Estados Unidos, en cantidades, especialmente los jóvenes. ¿Cómo está Fe de Casas como servicio, como actor en el desarrollo local? ¿Cómo se está enfrentando la situación de transferencia de remesas? ¿Cómo, cómo se han metido en esto en cuanto a llegar también al servicio en el exterior? Bueno, comentarles en primer lugar que todo arranca con la convicción, con el compromiso. Después de que se firmaron los acuerdos de paz en el año 92, nosotros decidimos entrar eh, como pioneros 
a hacer algo por los compatriotas que habían migrado eh, por persecución política, por falta de oportunidades económicas o cualquier otra causal, pero que ahora estaban sosteniendo la economía, que era un poco lo más cínico que nos podía pasar, que ahora que ya se van, que, dependamos, que realmente dependamos de ellos. Ya había que ayudar y nos metimos en el tema de remesas familiares. Originalmente nuestro sueño era hacerlo de, como uno dice, de Credit Union a Credit Union, pero no encontramos respuesta en las redes de Credit Union en el exterior y tuvimos que hacerlo a través de operadores internacionales. Actualmente nosotros lo hacemos con 18 operadores internacionales. Esta semana que estoy aquí me llamaron que hay otro operador que quiere formar parte de la red con nosotros eh, a nivel internacional. Y nosotros somos el referente para las cooperativas afiliadas. Quiero decir que esta es la parte de cooperación entre cooperativas, que es el sexto principio, porque cada cooperativa individualmente no podría hacer esos convenios internacionales porque hay que cumplir toda la normativa de prevención contra operaciones de ilícitos de lavado de dinero y otros que son sumamente caros. Entonces nosotros asumimos el costo y le damos cobertura a todas las cooperativas un efecto de sinergia. Además somos su federación y somos sin fines de lucro y las hemos involucrado y eso permite diversificar el servicio. Quiero plantear como el ejemplo que puse Remesa Familiar en el video que nosotros hemos tratado de meterle cultura a, a los asesores y a los directivos de las cooperativas, que los servicios son más bien no un fin en sí mismo, sino como puentes, como vehículos para lograr la inclusión financiera. O sea, que la gente que llega de remesa, el propósito no solo es pagar la remesa y tomar la comisión, sino que se termine afiliando y que sea asociado a la cooperativa y tenga acceso permanente a toda la gama de servicios. Esa agencia que vieron en, ahí en A60 tiene como... 25 metros cuadrados de local, pero da todos los servicios, ahorro, crédito, remesas, eh, seguros, eh, pago de servicios de colecturía, eh, todo lo que tiene cualquier, la central lo tiene también una agencia de ese tipo. Entonces nosotros tenemos que cubrir todo eso y eh, con los operadores internacionales y ese tema que se reguló el año pasado, por ejemplo, nosotros nos hemos convertido en los agentes pagadores y hemos inscrito a las cooperativas como subagentes pagadores de FEDECASES, y son las cooperativas miembros y unas no afiliadas que también están en alianza con nosotros para ampliar la red de servicios de remesas. A los operadores internacionales no les interesaría una cooperativa con tres agencias, les interesa una red de servicios cooperativos de 115 agencias en alrededor de 80 municipios del, principales en el territorio nacional. That's a great example of how you've been able to respond to a market need in terms of, of, of remittance transfers, but also addressing sort of the social and economic situation that was created out of that migration. Y quiero comentar que nosotros estamos pagando anualmente, el año pasado pagamos alrededor de 750 mil transferencias de remesas familiares, y eso significó entregarle a la gente alrededor de 240 millones de dólares en minutos. En minutos. Y estamos, estamos participando del total de remesas del país en el 5% del influjo de recursos de remesas en el país. Excelente, excelente. Um, I would like to you, um, thank you for an excellent presentation, okay. Héctor. Y please help me thank Héctor for okay, uh, his presentation. También. Thank you. Well done. So, in these three examples, Eric, Marcy, and Hector. Um, we have been able to take a look at what these partnerships between cooperatives and other organizations look like. What we've seen is an opportunity for these cooperatives to find common values and common objectives with local, national, and international partner partners. Um, in these three case studies, we've seen increased economic and social inclusion at the local and national levels. It, that includes women's empowerment, uh, youth empowerment, and also, oh, what's this? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, okay, so these are uh, a gift from which municipality, Hector? San Jose Guayaba. These are a gift from the artisans of San Jose Guayaba that will be given to each one of you at your table. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> very nice. 
We've also seen in these examples uh, provision of jobs and incomes, access to finance, access to improve access to health and education, as well as uh, influence in both local and national policies. I think we've been able to see that in these examples as well. So we've seen local development through cooperatives as part of national strategy, uh, this ability to grow and expand both from the coffee cooperative, uh, from Fede, the Fede Casas example, and also um, we've clearly seen cooperatives as vehicles for achieving the sustainable development goals at a local and national level. So this session has been about partnerships, about how cooperatives can partner at all levels to uh, strengthen their, our role as actors in, in international sustainable development. One of these important actors in this space has been, over decades, the microfinance institutions. And I think all of us know one of the most well-known pioneers in this space has been Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank was uh, started, uh, its inception was in 1976. It was started by Nobel laureate Professor Mohamed Yunus in Yemen Dash. And he started this movement based on two simple ideas. First, that credit is a human right, and that poor people know best how to improve their own situations. So in 2006, Professor Yunus and Grammy Bank received the Nobel Peace Prize, and as far as I know, it's the only business that has received the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's very significant. We are very fortunate today to have with us one of the founders of the Grammy Bank, Noor Jahan Begum is with us. She is the UNIS Center Advisor and former Managing Director of the Grameen Bank. Ms. Noor Jahan Begum currently works as an advisor to Nobel Laureate Professor Mohamed Yunus and has had an outstanding career with the Grameen Project since the very inception in 1976. She was one of the earliest associates of Professor Yunus during the establishment of the bank and she became acting managing director in 2011 when Professor Yunus decided to leave. She served as principal of Grameen Bank Central Training Institute and general manager training and special program of training and special programs and deputy managing director of the Grameen Bank. Currently, she is the director of Grameen Italia Foundation the Center for Mass Education and Science, and Grameen Phone Limited in Bangladesh, as well as Grameen Foundation in the United States. So needless to say, uh, Ms. Ms. Begum is uh, a pioneer in her own right in this space, uh, both as a microfinance um, uh, person, uh, microfinance leader, but also in development in general. And so we're very, very happy to have you here, and I welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> Today I will uh, mainly focus on coming bank and also social business. Human have moved from one civilization to another, each new one with a better prospect for the later. But over the past few decades, we have seen the world is facing one crisis to another. Financial crisis, food shortage, famine, energy shortage, environmental uh, problem, military conflicts, political instability, denial of the human rights, floods of the refugees from different countries, large-scale state-backed eviction of people, persecution of women and children. Hunger still persists in a large scale, murder of the innocent people and rape of the women and children is still daily concern. 
About half of the world wealth is concentrated in the hands of only five people. This report is from Oxfam. And only five nations now hold almost all power in the world. So we are living in an imbalanced world. This raises a pertinent question. Where are we heading to? And what future are we building for our children? What world and what legacy are we leaving for them? Our father, our forefather made a mistake. And still, if we do mistake, I don't know where we can go, where our children can go. We have no choice but use this backdrop to raise with a new movement built on values of empathy and solidarity. According to Professor Dinus, a human being is born to be active, creative, energetic, and problem solver, always seeking new ways to unleash his or her unlimited potential. This is what he is trying to make happen for more than four decades, starting from his Grameen Bank project. The success of Grameen Bank and Grameen Microcredit program all over the world, including the USA, in empowering the poor, especially the women, uh, access to the fact that is the possible if we want to make it happen. Grameen Bank and all over the microcredit in different countries of the world prove that it is doable job if we want it. Three simple premise of Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank, the world famous microcredit organization that won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 along with his creator, Professor Muhammad Yunus, started as an action research project. The bank was created on three very simple premises but put forward by Professor Muhammad Yunus. Credit is a fundamental human rights. Normally, traditional bank doesn't allow poor people to get any loan because according to them, poor are not credit worthy. So Grameen Bank, what did they get, uh, we start to give the loan to the poor people, especially to the women. Every human being is born entrepreneur and what is needed is unleashing their creative capacities. A credit delivery recovery mechanism appropriate for the poor he reasoned could do a miracle in achieving it. Trust on Grameen Bank run on the trust. Professor Hinus has always argued that human being is born with the ultimate unlimited capacity. But the institution we have developed do not allow most of the people to utilize their own potentiality. As a result, the remain stunt like a bonsai tree. Bonsai tree and uh, giant tree, there is no difference. Seed are the same. Only bonsai tree doesn't allow them to grow, and giant tree uh, grow as it lies. So, and poor also forced to live in poverty and misery. Only opportunity makes the difference. Modus of operandi of Grameen Bank. The modus operandi of Grameen Bank is very simple. Organizer, organize poor people, especially women in groups and center. Center means five people makes a group and ten uh, cent, uh, groups make a center. Groups who uh, regularly meet in a weekly meeting at a center house located in the village and gives collateral free credit to the member to uh, debate in a small weekly installment. Loan decision and savings collection are also conducted at the center meeting. Loan utilization is strictly monitored both by the center and the bank. Every group has its chairperson and every center is under chief who are the changing every year, creating leadership capacity in the members. Once a loan is given to the rest, it's done by the borrowers and the market. Borrower can save with the bank in different kinds of savings scheme. The bank, which has so far disbursed nearly 23 US, billion US dollars in loans, currently has a loan outstanding of US 1.7 billion against savings outstanding of 
2.40 billion, of which borrowers saving amount to nearly 1.60 billion, the rest of by the non villagers. But there's a history. When you start uh, to ask them, request them to save a small money in 1976, all of them denied because they say, how we can get the money, how we can save? So I came to Dr. Inus and asked that these poor people are saying that they cannot save because they don't have the money. So he says, uh, tell them every day when they are cooking their food, just put a one peaceful uh, rice in another pot and after one week they can sell it or they can save the money instead of buying the food. So our first uh, savings was one fourth of one taka. I don't know as a penny and uh, is one taka, uh, one fourth of one taka. Now many of them are saving per uh, week or per month, 1,000, 5,000, 2,000, whatever they like. So the scheme, uh, you can understand how it's come. It's not one day, it's gradually it comes in that way. Technically, the loan operation of the bank is financed by the savings of its borrowers and other deposit, which is one of half times higher than the current loans. Repayment rate of all Grameen loans is nearly 99%. The bank disbursed about 170 million US dollar every month as a loan. Loan insurance. Another significant deployment is introduction of loan insurance in case of death. Borrowers pay a premium against each loan, 3% on loan amount for borrower and another 3% for the husband if they want. And full exemption is received in the case of death of either the borrower or husband, whatever it is. We also provide education loan. GB borrower's child may receive an education loan from the bank for higher studies. This loan is offered a very convenient condition, 5% yearly interest, which starts after completion of the education and one year grace period after completion of studies for repayment. <coughs> More than 50,000 Grameen children have so far received this loan. GB also provides a scholarship. Those who are doing very well in the class, they are also getting nearly 250,000 students have so far received a scholarship from the bank. Women empowerment. <coughs> I think I, I go back uh, to uh, 1976. What was the situation of women in Bangladesh? Women mobility was very, very restricted. Uh, normally, they don't earn any money. They keep in the home. They are dependent on the husband or father or brother, whatever it is. Uh, husband can have many wives, one, two, three, four, whatever. He can divorce wife and left children and wife behind. So far, you can understand what is the condition of a woman. And husband uh, beating wife is common. So when we start to talk with the women to receive a loan, most of them denied. So how is it possible? I am a woman. I never handle any money. Why you are requesting me to handle the money? Do it on a business. You go to my husband, my husband can do that. So initially we have in mind that at least 50% should be the woman and 50% should be the man. But later on we found that women are much more credited. There are about 9, uh, 9 million borrowers in Grameen Bank, of whom 97% are good now with the women. It is not that we only uh, give the loan to the women, but I think that uh, women prove themselves they are the much more creditworthy. The bank is run by a board director of comprising 12 representatives, nine of whom are Grameen's women borrowers. Some of them don't know how to read, how to write but they are talented too. They are the ones who take the decision of the bank. It is generally established fact that when credit goes to the women, it benefits goes to the family and children. Increase 
In women, income means better food, better health care, better housing, and better education of the family. Then question, why? Because poverty is more women issue. If someone has to start in the family, it is unwritten law, this is the mother. A woman takes the family condition more seriously. Women always wants to make a strong roof on top for the children. She wants to build good future for the children. He wants to have good food, good cloth, and wants to a good education for their children. So uh, we found in Grameen Bank that if money goes through the women, it can bring much more benefit for the whole family. We are talking about the empowerment of the women. In such in Bangladesh, uh, here also I heard from you, normally asset doesn't own by the women. Normally it belongs to the men. So we designed some uh, program so that women can enrich. In 1984, we started to give the housing loan. Most of the uh, poor people doesn't owe, uh, have any house. So it is difficult for them to raise the chicken, to raise the cow, goat, whatever it is. So we start to give them a housing loan, but designed in such a way that if anybody wants to have a housing loan, the land must be in the name of the person. So now, if woman wants to have a loan, husband has to transfer a piece of land in the name of the wife, or she has to buy a land in her own name. Now she uh, built the house with a Grameen Bank credit. And before our Grameen uh, housing loan, uh, divorce rate was very high. I already mentioned husband can left wife behind and go uh, another uh, place, have another wife. But now it is difficult to divorce wife because she is the owner of the house. So this is a, another woman empowerment came through our own design uh, housing law. Technology, this is another uh, part that it makes uh, more empowerment, brings more empowerment for the women. Technology can bring much more benefit to the women if it is designed in that way. The village phone program started in the late 19th 1990s, while phone are extremely scary in rural Bangladesh and out of reach even in the middle class. I never saw during that time a mobile phone. It gives hundreds of thousands of poor illiterate Grameen borrowers opportunity to become entrepreneur, selling phone service in the village and earn significant income from their families. Number of such phone ladies in currently 1.77 million the village phone not only accords the additional income for the, these women, it increased their confidence, mobility, bargaining capacity, and social respect. We uh, also, we not only not give the loans, we also have some social agenda we call 16 decision. Uh, I will say these, some of them. We shall follow and advance the fourth principle of Grameen Bank, discipline, unity, courage and hard work in all work of our lives. We shall bring prosperity to our families. We shall grow vegetable all the year round. We shall eat plenty of them and sell the surplus. Why uh, we bring all these things? Because we saw in uh, there are some superstitutions. They have some traditional uh, thinking way that if a woman is pregnant, they only uh, take rice. Uh, onion and uh, one chili. Uh, they say that if uh, you take uh, too much food, your baby will be grown up and it is difficult to produce the baby. So you know the cause of the malnutrition. So we motivate them to cultivate, uh, to produce a lot of vegetables, to eat it them and surplus they can uh, sell. We shall grow vegetables all the year round. We shall eat plenty of them and sell the surplus. During the plantation season, we shall plant as many said seeding as possible. We shall plan to keep our families small. During that time, uh, most of the women have eight children, nine children, ten children. So we have to motivate them to uh, keep family small. We shall educate our children and ensure that we can earn to pay for their education. We shall always uh, be ready to help each other you are talking about the cooperation, 
So we also do the same things in Grameen to uh, help each other. If anyone in his difficulty, we shall all help him or her. We shall take part in all social activities collectively. Changing the perspective. Grameen Bank is a glaring example of how simple change in your institution and thought can make a miracle. The bank has made significant change in the economy of Bangladesh by boosting economy from the bottom by turning millions of the unemployed poor people into entrepreneurs, by increasing their income and thus enabling them to improve the social, educational and health status of the families. Uh, many researchers have confirmed it. What kind of world we want? According to Professor Yunus, poverty, unemployment, and carbon emission are the three most pressing problems of the world today. And the ideal world, he argues, should be one free from all these issues. To address the problem, Professor Yunus has established innumerable social business. He uh, make 50 social business in Bangladesh like Grameen Bank, Grameen Shakti, Grameen Healthcare Trust, and also in collaboration with famous worldwide business Grameen Intel, Grameen Danone Food, Grameen Biolia Water, Grameen Kugulana, Grameen Uniqlo, Japan Automacanic School. Some Grameen companies in Bangladesh, Grameen Shakti. Grameen Shakti, this is a renewable energy company, uh, started in 1996, at the time of 36% of the rural household did not have access to any kind of electricity. Shokti started working in the field of solar home system, biogas, and improved cooking stove. Shokti has so far installed over 1.7 million solar home system with an electricity generation capacity of 68.38 megawatt with a daily power generation capacity is 184.62 megawatt hour. Besides installing solar home system, Shokti has constructed 33,113 biogas plant and installed about 1 million improved cooking stove, serving the total 18.86 million people in Bangladesh with alternative energy. This has saved the beneficiary families from the hazard of using fossil fuel and firewood, the environment from emission of greenhouse gases and the communities and the environment from the deforestation. Women and their employment are a special focus in Shakti activities. They are not only getting the benefit of renewable energy technology from Gramin Shakti. This to the poor, Professor Renews has established a nursing college and several eye care hospitals. Gramin Caledonian College Nursing, with the objective of addressing the acute shortage of training nurse this college, established in 2010 in collaboration with Glasgow Caledonian College of Nursing, offers diploma and BSc course in nursing. Grameen borrowers girl children are offered loan to cover cost of education which they repay in installment after graduation. At the spring 2017, 634 students were admitted in the college and 223 graduated with a diploma degree. Almost all of the graduates have received immediate position in the leading hospital of Bangladesh, while a few went abroad for higher education. Without this opportunity, most of the girls would not be able to receive any further education, and life of most of them would end in the early marriage and to be limited within the daily core of poor rural life. Grameen DC Eye Care Hospital. The first Grameen Eye Care Hospital was established in 2008. Currently, there are three such hospitals that have so far treated more than 1 million patients and performed 65,000 vision saving operations. This hospital, in which poor people receive treatment at a low cost, that is subsidized by the charging higher cost on the non rich, on, on the rich, are fully financially sustainable. A new hospital is under construction. Many of these patients, if they have not received the service, would remain blind for their whole life. Young entrepreneurs. All over the world, a significant member of the youth 
both educated and uneducated or unemployed. One important reason for persistent unemployment is that our education system is designed for a job employment, not to create entrepreneur. To address this problem, actually while we provide uh, education loan to our members' children, when they graduate, they come to Grameen and ask for a job. So doctor, how much job we can give? So he came with an idea, why not they can transform themselves as entrepreneurs. So now, through this program, we are providing them equity so that they can be an yeah, entrepreneur. Professor Yunus started the Young Entrepreneur Program. Its objective to create entrepreneurs, especially among the second generation members of Grameen Bank families. Equity fund to the young entrepreneur are supplied by the social business fund created by Grameen. The young entrepreneur fund are business partners they are engaged in a business relationship where young entrepreneur is a shareholder with a token, minority or majority shares. The young entrepreneur may become the managing partner or the manager of the business. The social business fund monitors the performance of the manager, managing partner without getting involved in the actual running of the business. The entrepreneur has to be paid 20% share transfer fee along with the investment amount to become completed owner of the business. Two years, three years, five years, whatever it, then he has to pay 20% uh, share, 20% uh, transfer fee. So far more uh, than 20,000 young entrepreneurs are supplied equity fund from the social business fund, each fund amounting from one to 500,000 Bangladeshi taka. Towards new civilization, Professor Inu says, the purpose of human life on this planet is not merely to survive, but to live on it with a grace, beauty, and happiness. It is up to us to make it happen. We can create a new civilization not based on greed, but on the full range of human values. Let us begin today. What is the spirit behind it? Professor Inu shows us where the impetus for the change will come from. Human beings are not money-making robots. They are multidimensional beings with both selfishness and selflessness. When I create social business, I am allowing the selfishness side of my personality to be expressed through business. Social business is about using creativity to solve human problems in a sustainable way. I define social business as a non-dividend company dedicated to solving human problems. Well concentration, according to Professor Inus, is the ultimate consequence of the present capitalist structure that goes on accumulating world's wealth in a few and fewer hands. It turns it is a ticking time bomb and warns the unless we can reverse the process of Wealth concentration, our social, economic, and political structure will soon explode. He believes that only charity cannot change the world. What we need is recognized economic structure that will unleash the unlimited potential of the individual and build a society based not on greed but on mutual responsibility. Money making is happiness, but making others happy is super happiness. Thank you. No, this is, uh, thank you. That was excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And if you could stay there, we would like to yeah. engage you in some, some conversation here. I'm gonna kick it off by um, making a couple of observations. I think one of the things that, uh, we've been able to learn from your presentation and from Grameen Bank and from the, the, the social business from the so yes from the social business model that you laid out is that we have a lot of parallels with the cooperative movement for example um, some of the things I think that we share is the role of people at the center of, of development it's a model of inclusion and empowerment putting decision-making in the hands of people 
and unlocking human potential. Um, it, uh, another uh, point is an integrated approach to development. Uh, you could see that the social business model has now been applied to very many sectors, not just the financial inclusion piece. Um, the focus on human need, not human greed. I, greed. I know that Pauline Green, our former president of the International Cooperative Alliance, used to say that cooperatives are about uh, addressing human need and not greed. Um, and so I think that from a, a, a perspective of looking at our commonalities between the social business model of Grameen and the and cooperatives, there's, there are very, very clear par parallels. Um, I think the question to you uh, to kick off this conversation is, what is the philosophy of your partnership uh, around partnerships? What, how do you, what do you, how do you think about partnerships? Um, what kind of partnerships support this model? And then the second question is, what can this business model that you laid out from Grameen also learn from the cooperative movement that also focuses on social and economic benefit and has one billion members around the world. So that, I'm just gonna start that, kick it off, and then um, pass it on to other questions after you okay, answer. Okay, your uh, second question that uh, cooperative also, I don't know uh, my many more things about the cooperative, what I have learned from here. You are also doing very good things, you are accumulating people, you are organizing people, you are addressing uh, some problem. I saw in the uh, East Timur, they are addressing uh, 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 coffee. So different kind of words. Uh, everything is addressed to development of the human being. Whatever it is, Grameen Bank or uh, cooperative, whatever it is. But mainly, uh, both of us addressing the human development. Maybe our path is different. So, uh, if we target, if we believe on the human being's development, then I think uh, this uh, easy to help each other. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much. Just Would you be willing to take one or two more yeah, questions? Yeah, okay, yeah. excellent. Okay, any other questions? For Ms. Begum. According to my country uh, prospect during that time, uh, I think all of us uh, know about the poverty. Yep. Uh, when people are poor, uh, they want to have full their stomach, whatever it. During famine, they eat whatever it. It is uh, what is available to their doorstep. So in Bangladesh. Uh, during that time, our literacy rate was 13% only. Most of the people don't know how to read, how to write. And a lot of superstitions, lot of ignorance, lot of discrimination among uh, men and women was, uh, exist in the community. So uh, I already mentioned that uh, even you see uh, some uh, people say, if you uh, take green leaves, uh, it will be uh, dangerous for your health, but it is totally a uh, mistake. So all these things uh, they don't know because of their uh, lack of knowledge. Number two, 
they cannot uh, buy all these vegetables and they don't know about the importance of the vegetables. So what Grameen Bank do, we not only give the awareness among the people, we provide seed and sapling to their doorstep. And uh, our way of motivation is not that uh, our people is going to them and motivating them. We sit together, we organize some workshop. In workshop, uh, 35 women sit together, they are the leader of the center, and we discuss about the problem. What is the problem we have? So they discuss uh, in depth one, two, three, four, five uh, problem. Then we discuss how to solve all this problem. What is the reason behind? Then we uh, raise the issue, then come on some uh, opinion. Then we take the decision, OK, for uh, this uh, serious problem, we can take this decision. So this is not from the Grameen Bank decision. This is a decision from the uh, members of Grameen. So involving them, it is coming from the grassroots level. So uh, your question, why these people? This is for the poverty. This is for the lack of knowledge. This is for the uh, superstitution. And also, uh, they don't have the habit. So they're doing that way. But it is all, but it is totally now a change. Most of our women know what kind of, uh, even they know that how they should cook the food because we discuss in the center all these issues. So when you involve uh, these poor people, we, you need, uh, of course, you need much more passion. They can ask you question and question. Uh, my forefather was done in that way, but you have to respond uh, uh, very passionately. We have time for one more, yes, back there, one more question, okay. Our interest rate is 20% in simple rate, but if you say in the flat rate, is a 10%. Our government of Bangladesh and Central Bank of Bangladesh decided uh, flat rate is 12.5%, uh, and if it is simple rate, it is 25%. So we are below the government uh, fixed rate. So we are not charging more. Then another uh, answer is that, if people are not feeling good, if uh, interest is too high, then why they are joining to Grameen? It is number is increasing day by day. If people are not benefited, people are not stupid. People uh, are really, really very intelligent. So you see, Grameen Bank uh, giving a loan for the for income generating activities, it is 10% flat rate and 20% uh, as a simple uh, interest. But Grameen Bank also provide education loan, 5% uh, for their uh, children. And uh, during education time, no interest will calculate. After they finish their education and uh, our one year's grace period, then interest will calculate. So they are getting these opportunities. Number three, housing loan it 8%. So if you, and uh, we also uh, have a beggar loan, it is 0%. So in Grameen, we have varieties of uh, works. So people uh, like it and people join it. 
And about the, uh, our uh, repayment rate is uh, 99%. Uh, actually, in the microcredit program, monitoring and supervision is the main part. And also, involving of the group. Our system is that five people makes a group, and within the five people, there is one uh, uh, chairman. And within the center, 10, cent uh, 10 group makes a center. There is a center chief. So this is the responsibility of the uh, group and also the center when they get the loan to monitor, to supervise whether she is going proper way or she is doing some mistake. And this is the one part of the center wise involving themselves and also the bank part. Bank also regularly monitor. We have 25,000 staff in Grameen Bank. Every day, every morning, these 25,000 staff visiting every village. So the close monitoring system and supervision make it happen. And number two, it doesn't mean that people are not uh, fa uh, failing their business. Sometimes they fail in their business. It can happen. Sometimes their cow may die. Sometimes the, uh, his or her business can fail. It. Then what to do? We feel that nothing wrong. He can fail one time, but we sit together. What is the real problem? What? Uh, it's happened. We discuss thoroughly, then we take a one detour. Main path she missed, now we take a, another detour. So we give her uh, another small loan and uh, follow uh, very strictly and uh, committedly and encouraging her to come to again the main path. So she, first loan she will give, if she can, she can give a little one, but second loan she has to pay 100%. So in that way, gradually she comes to uh, main part. So we always encourage, we always believe that because when you are getting uh, benefit, why you leave uh, Grammy? So we give them and we give them uh, opportunity, we give them, uh, encourage them so that uh, they can come to the again uh, mainstream and uh, do their. That's why our repayment rate is uh, 99%. Begum, we'd like to thank you so much for being here with us. It was such a pleasure to have you here. Um, we, we've learned a lot. We've shared um, a lot of, of similar uh, values and approaches, and, and we appreciate you being at, this at the International Cooperative Alliance, and we hope that um, we can continue to explore ways of working together and partnership and for the benefit of, of thank people. You. So thank, thank you. you so very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Please help me. Thank you. Before we close, um, just to wrap up the session again, thank you to Marcy, Eric, Hector, and Ms. Begum for being with us and sharing the stories about partnership partnerships and international development within the cooperative movement. Um, I think we've, we've learned a lot from, from all of the speakers, both from the session this afternoon as well as the morning session, to show that in partnership, um, we can have an even greater impact, both at local, regional, national, and international levels, and um, that there are many successful examples of how cooperatives are working uh, with each other and together with other actors to be effective in achieving the sustainable development goals. So thanks again to all of the speakers. Thanks to all of you for being here and for asking great questions. Uh, before we end, we wanted to invite everyone to join the networking event. Uh, it's a networking and launching of the Malaysian Carnival of Cooperative Products and Services. And that will be taking place from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. tonight. It's at level CP3 in the Sunway Pyramid Convention Center. Is that, that's different, is that different than where we are here? Okay, so across the way over at the Sunway Pyramid Convention Center, level CP3, it's like Star Wars, C, CP3, oh, whatever. Um, CP3 uh, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. 
and uh, Monique LaRue and the president of ANCASA will be officiating that and there will be cocktails and drinks served during that networking event. So please join us. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for participating and have a great evening.